This is the Holland Assets Podcast, where we show you how to start and run your own trucking company. Ever wanted to go out on your own? Follow Chris as he goes through the highs and lows of running on his own authority. Welcome, everybody, to episode 146 of the Holland Assets Podcast. I am your host, Craig. Over there, he is Chris. How you doing, Craig? I'm all right. I'm yeah. all right for a, you know, a, a for Tuesday a, morning. A dreary Tuesday winter morning. Yeah, well, we'll talk about the weather in a sec, I think. But I want to let people know what we're talking about today because there are a few things that we're going to go over. Today is about finding loads. It's the second episode in the Finding Loads series because that's a thing that I just made up, the Finding Loads series. Uh, so we are going to get to that, but it's going to be a few minutes because we have some exciting stuff to announce. Uh, there is something called Holland Assets Academy. I think tentatively titled. Is that a final? No, that's, 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 that's it. That's the that's title. The title. Holland Assets Academy. So we're going to be talking about that a little bit. But first, I want to remind everybody to go to hollandassetsllc.com and motorcarrierhq.com for all of the tools, tips, resources, and show notes that you need uh, during and after this episode. Um, and also, Chris, we mentioned the weather, this dreary January weather, and yeah. you mentioned something going out on the roads, uh, going yeah, this, on out on the roads with the weather. This winter has been weird because it seemed like it was super mild, and then sometime around the first week of January, it just went nuts. And we've had, um, I-80 has shut down several times. We've had icy roads in Mississippi and like- a, <laughs> Nice so bad that drivers had to shut down and just, you know, the kind of things that don't happen every year. And it's just, it's been crazy. Like I'm, I, you know, in the last two weeks have just been horrendous and I'm, I'm ready for winter to be over. Yeah. So what, uh, uh have you guys had any wrecks, any issues, no damage? We've been lucky. We, we haven't had any damage. We haven't had any wrecks. We've had a few loads that have been delivered late, which I h hate, mm -hmm. but when it's weather, you know, for the most part, it's kind of out of your control and, yeah. and, and receivers usually and shippers, you know, have a little bit more patience this time of year when there are big weather events like this coming along. So it <laughs> hasn't caused any damage, but it's still like it frustrates me. So, so they have a little bit of patience. What about you? Because no, the way I, you just said that, yeah, you, I, it made me think I, I wouldn't want to be in Chris's war path when <laughs> there's a late load out on the road. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm patient and, and I'm, I'm good with the drivers. Like I, it's <laughs> it's not their fault, but I, 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 I can get to be a little bit of an anxious person. And yeah. when things are running late, like that, my kids, like that's one of the things they hate about me is like, I'm a, I'm kind of a time Nazi. And so I need, <laughs> I need to chill out. I need to learn to chill out a little bit better when it comes to being late for things. Uh, well, it must be my military background. There's, you know, I, I snuck a peek ahead. Uh, and you mentioned later in this episode, um, the, the 24 hour clock, is yeah. that is that's getting into your time nazi yeah kind of stuff of like yep. use the 24 hour clock it ah. is. yep okay all right well we're gonna get there <laughs> so <laughs> be careful out there everybody be safe uh drive well and uh you know get home alive yes. uh, every winter that's our wish uh so chris holland assets academy uh, we're going to try to keep this relatively short because uh, it's something that's coming down the pike, but is not here yet. So people are going to be hearing more about this as we go. But Holland Assets Academy, what is it or rather what's it going to be? So it, it's a project that a, a great team and I have been working on for a little while and we're getting really close to the end where we can actually launch it and make it work. But it's it's basically an online video based paid learning system that can help you know, guys and gals take their trucking education to a whole new level. Okay. So, so an online course for lack of a better word, I get, it sounds grander than a course. Yeah. Um, and this is a place where people are going to be able to distill and not just distill, but kind of broaden their knowledge of what we've talked about on this podcast, right? Yep. Yeah. It'll, it'll take a lot of the same topics that we talk about in the podcast, but dive it down even deeper. There's going to be, it's going to be video. So, you know, you'll be able to, for instance, you know, the podcast, the last um, dispatching finding loads podcast that we talked about where I went into the systems, I'll actually, we'll go into the systems. We'll take a deeper dive mm. into them, show how I use them um, and, and make it, 
easier for somebody to learn that whole process much more quickly than I did. And we'll do the same thing with accounting. We'll talk, we'll go in and show you how to do QuickBook entries and how we set things up. And it just, it takes everything to a, a much more detailed granular piece. So, so you can learn a lot faster. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it reminds me of uh, what do they call it? Masterclass is that, that uh, yeah. online learning series yep. where you've, worked in this industry for over a decade now. Uh, so you've learned a ton of lessons and there's no real substitute for time, right? It, it just takes time to learn, to really internalize some things. However, a course like this, it, for my money, and I've participated in a few, it's a great starting point where people are given the tools and the vocabulary for the industry to get them started so that gathering that those years of experience isn't so intimidating yeah. that it's easier to, to get started. Is that fair? Yeah. It, it'll, you know, it'll just make your learning process kind of a, take it to a lightning speed. It'll, it'll make it much more faster. You won't have to go through some of the same growing pains that mm -hmm. I have or that other people do and, and just, you know, set your path to success on a much quicker pace, which, right. which is, which is really good. Um, and, and it's one of those things that'll, it'll be with the way we're designing it, it's going to work well, whether you have one truck or you have a, a, a fleet of trucks, um, you're going to be able to learn a lot from it and it's going to be able to help you be even more successful. Um, so if you're excited to learn a little bit more and, and be able to accelerate your education, um, go to this episode's page at hollandassetsllc.com. So episode 146, and there'll be a, a pop-up on it that you'll be able to enter your email address, register for updates, and we'll also send you out a discount code um, for listeners once it, once it launches. Ooh, yeah. It's 85% off, right, Chris? Um, maybe not quite that much, but it'll be a good deal. <laughs> uh, all right, so Holland Assets LLC, go check out the notes for this episode, get signed up. Um, and that's one of those things where I hope tons and tons of people do it because there's literally no harm, no risk to it. Just uh, go check out what it's going to be. And uh, and I, I guarantee you'll be excited when it finally hits your inbox. It'll be good. Yeah. All right, Chris, uh, we want to talk about finding loads again. So what have you been up to? What wisdom do you want to impart today about your method of finding loads? So I'm, I'm up to dispatching eight trucks now. Um, I'm going to have nine and 10 coming along here in, in the next week, week and a half. Um, and so I've, I've learned a, an absolute ton, you know, I've, I've been doing it coming up on almost four months now and, um, dispatching is a very detail oriented. It's very hectic. It's fast paced. There's a lot going on, which makes it so that it's easy to make mistakes and it's mm. easy to do things wrong. Um, in order to prevent that from happening and staying as efficient as you possibly can, you need to have a really good process. Um, and, and follow that process kind of religiously. And if you do that, you know, you're know you going to eliminate those mistakes, you're going to operate more efficiently, and you're going to be more successful at finding those loads. And so that's kind of really what we're going to talk about today is kind of that process, some of the things that uh, have helped me um, manage and, and make, his, make a hectic job not quite so hectic. <laughs> All right. So uh, let's, do we want to do a well, I don't know, a day in the life. Like, what, what does it actually look like? Yeah, when, a, yeah, we can do that. When do you start? And do you do this every day? Or is this uh, um, like, uh, oh, I, on Wednesdays, I do dispatching <laughs> and, no, and I, wear pink. I am doing dispatching every day, Monday through Friday. And honestly, I mean, there's, because how I've got it set up and it all falls on me right now, and, and this will change a little bit as time goes on, but I'm, I'm even doing some work on Saturdays and Sundays. Mm. Usually not as much. Like the actual finding loads, there, unless there's an emergency, which doesn't happen too often, um, I'm not trying to find a load on a Saturday or Sunday. You already found them through the week. Yeah, I found them through the week. And, and there's not as much posted on Saturdays and Sundays. Usually brokers are only posting that stuff if they also have an emergency, like if a truck cancels mm. on them or something happens. So Saturdays and Sundays, not the best days to, to be finding loads. So essentially Monday through Friday, I am starting my day at no later than. It's usually closer to um, 7.30, but for sure by eight o'clock Eastern time. 
So in Utah, for me, that's 5.30. Like 5.36, I'm sitting in front of my computer and working on stuff. And and I and I feel like you can start at the 8 o'clock Eastern, 6 o'clock Utah time, as long as you've done some pre-planning the day before, because you you essentially say I'm finding loads for three different trucks that I that I need to get loads for. I want to have those set up on the load boards at six o'clock, ready to go looking for loads. Mm. So those searches and everything need to be all set up. So if I if is I that can, is that because that's the way you like to operate, Mister Military Man? Uh, you're an early riser, or is that? the best way to do it it's the best way to do it like it is legitimately like it's it's the whole early bird gets the worm type thing like your most loads like start posting around eight o'clock eastern time um there, there's going to be stuff on there but a lot of the time that it's kind of old data the new stuff really starts posting then and that's when most of the the brokers um, their office is open. And so that's when you can call them and ask them about loads and actually mm. book them. You know, sometimes you'll see loads on there earlier, but then you call and they're like, hey, we're not open till eight. So, what, if, what if somebody is concentrating on Western time zones, Pacific and mountain time zones, and they're really only driving around there? Would you still say, hey, you, you should I'd get up early? still get up early. Because I, I think in the West, there's more of that tendency to get up early. That's the, the because brokers and dispatchers and everybody are kind of there is that bleed over from the east coast so i think even in the west for the most part that's still the time that you need to get going and and a lot of times a lot of those loads you'll take for example i'll just throw a, a big name um, brokerage out there tql um, they're kind of more east coast based but mm. they have a lot of west coast freight and so so you're still communicating you're still, with the East Coast. You're still a lot of times communicating with the East Coast. So right. I like you miss out on a lot of stuff if you start after eight o'clock Eastern time. You know, you say eight o'clock Eastern time, Chris, but I've already teased you for the uh, 24 hour clock. I'm shocked that you didn't say 0800. 0800. Yeah. It's, it's not O because O is a letter. You 0, know what? 800. <laughs> Your mom's a letter. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, mom. <laughs> Craig really does love you. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, sometimes I revert to my 15 year old jokes. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> you did write a note about I, I prefer the 24 hour clock. Why is that? And, and why should we stop making fun of you for that? Um, because the 24 hour clock is way superior to what we use <laughs> in the U.S. <laughs> you sound like somebody talking about metric. <laughs> The metric Joe, system also Joe. is superior to what we use in the U.S. Nope. Yep. Uh, nope. Sorry. Just because you can't understand it doesn't mean it's worse. Oh, I understand it. But I'm also, you know <laughs> what, Chris? I'm proud to be an American. Okay, Thank maybe you. Maybe we'll have to. So I've got a <laughs> story time. Okay. I've got a story at the end about a debacle that happened in my life because of the 24-hour time clock. <laughs> Um, so we'll, we'll okay. save that story to the end because it has nothing to do with trucking, okay. but it is a good story. That means we got to get through this in 24 minutes or less. <laughs> well, right? that's probably not going to happen. We'll still do the story at the end. <laughs> all right. So, uh, all right. So set up. So use a 24 hour time clock in all seriousness. I mean, that's most of what most of the trucking industry uses anyways. It, it's super easy to get confused in things and you don't mm. want to be off 12 hours. You don't want to be, <laughs> right. um, thinking you've got a, um, one in the afternoon delivery when it's really a one in the morning delivery. Right. So like use the 24 hour time clock. That's what most of the industry uses anyway. Um, it'll, it'll prevent problems. It, well, you know, it is hilarious to hear my seven year old <clears throat> hear that something is happening at three o'clock and she goes in the morning or at, in the afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, think about it. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. So, so dispatching loads, you're getting up early, you're hunting around, working on East Coast time, no matter where you are. Um, what, what's next? What's your next uh, train of thought? Um, another thing that's important is, is when you, you know, you kind of want to get things set up and you want to, you want to stay ahead of the game. You, you don't want to be playing um, catch up. And we'll talk a little bit about this in, in a few minutes in more detail. But then as part of that, you want to, you just, you want to be prepared for everything. So for example, um, you need to have your company information completely memorized, your your address, your phone number, um, and, and those are pretty self-explanatory, but your DOT number and your MC number, like typically a lot of the times, one of the first things when you call a broker, they're going to ask for is what's your MC number because mm. they're going to pull you up, look you up, see your company data. And this is another reason why it's so important to keep your safety stuff squared away. 
Um, because if, if you've got bad safety scores, they're probably just going to pass on you. Um, but have, have those kind of things memorized. Um, also, um, anytime you start with a new broker, you're going to have to have a, um, you're going to submit a broker packet. Mm, and, right. and a lot of the times they do these things online and it's, it's fairly simple. You can kind of read through their contract online, sign it. Um, they'll, they'll oftentimes pull all your company info from the FMCSA and put it right into the contract. So it's, it's actually with the online ones are super easy. Yeah. Um, but sometimes they'll send them to you as a, as a PDF document. You just kind of have to fill it out yourself and read through it. And how, it. Uh, sorry, basic question from the basic guy. How often are you doing that? Uh, if you're, let's say you're not just starting out, you're not month one, uh, as an owner operator, but you've been doing this for three years, five years. Uh, how many broker packets are you filling out or do you get to a point where, Hey, I've got my brokers. I, at, I'm at, at this point, even with 10, 11 trucks running, um, I probably don't do a new one more than once a week. Okay. Once, once a week, probably. On and how long does it take you to do a broker packet? If it's online, you can, it depends on how thorough you want to be reading the contract. The contract's yeah. the hard thing, but once you've seen enough of them, you kind of know what to look for and you can kind of skim through them and, and go quick. Like you can, you can do one in, as er, as quick as five minutes. Okay. If, if All right. You, so it's not that bad. It's not that bad. Uh, oftentimes you either have to, if they're emailing it to you, there's some documents you have to email to them or you upload to them. And so, and just about every time you're going to have to provide them your certificate of authority, your um, certificate of insurance, and then also your W-9. Right. And so, you know, I, I have a separate folder, for instance, in my, um, on my computer that has those three documents on it. So it makes it really easy, really quick. I can go snag them, attach them to an email or upload them super easy. So it's, it's just doing things like that as you build your process so that things operate quickly and smoothly. Okay. All right. So know your company, you got to have your info squared away. Part of knowing your company though, is knowing your drivers. Let's talk about that because working with brokers is one thing as a dispatcher, but I imagine there's some juggling to do as far as, oh, you know what? This load would be great for this driver because they like to drive to this part of the country or the timing works out, right? Something yep. like that. Yeah. Our, so you take, for example, when I, whenever we bring on a new driver, either one of our existing drivers that I start dispatching or we hire a new driver, one of the very first things I do is I, I either sit down with them or I, I get on a phone call with them. And I kind of have a bunch of questions that I ask where I try to find out how they like to run. You know, it's, it's pretty similar to some of the questions that we ask when, um, when we first screen somebody to hire, mm -hmm. but this, this goes into a little bit more detail. So I, I, I know when, what hours of the day they like to run at, you know, how many miles a day they like to go. Cause our, our kind of minimum expectations with our drivers is that they need to be willing to go 500 miles a day. But then I've got some drivers that that's what, that's kind of all they want to do 500 miles a day. Then I have some drivers that if I can get 750 miles in a day, I'm going to run 750 miles. They're mm, going to run as hard yeah. as they want. And so that you kind of have to take that into account when, um, when you're hiring and when you're finding loads and, and you need to know all that stuff. So I, I make sure I find all that out so that I can try to operate as best as they can. And, and I always come to the, you know, one of the things I always say to them is, you know, it, this is a, it's got to be a partnership. It's got to be a win-win. Sometimes I'm going to have to, um, compromise a little bit with you. Sometimes you're going to have to compromise a little bit with me, but overall we're going to try to operate within these parameters 80%, 90% of the time. Right. Okay. All right. So trying to create that, that win-win for both you and the driver. Um, and that, gosh, so you have to know your drivers probably pretty intimately as far as what's their family situation. Yeah. What's their, you know, do they have any, Oh, well, no, I don't, I don't want to get into too much depth of to what it could be, but uh, you got to know them really well. You do. Yeah. You get to know them really, really well. And you, you get to know what their likes and dislikes are. And, um, you know, when they've got family things that they need to work through, I mean, we always try to accommodate that the, the best that we can. And, yeah. and uh, like, I'm, I'm pretty good. Like if you can plan well and you can forecast well, you can work around a lot of different things. Right. And I imagine you're keeping track of specific numbers, like the miles they've run so far this month when you are considering sending them out. 
uh, the hours that they've done the last week or two, yeah. right? Stuff like that. I do. Yeah. yeah. And so you have to, you know, that's another thing you need to stay on top of their hours of service. So you, every, before you book every load, like I'll typically, sometimes I just know off the top of my head, oh, you know what? He just left Utah, gone, you know, to let's say Kansas city. So not that far of a drive. I know, I know hours of service just off the top of my head right. aren't going to cause any issue, but then you maybe have another driver that's drove from Salt Lake to Florida and then Florida to, um, let's say Pennsylvania. Um, then I'm going to have to look at it and say, okay, I know there's probably going to be, there could potentially be some hours of service limitations on this next run that I mm. take. And I'll really dive down into it, see how many hours they have left, see when they start recapping hours and, um, and, and make a, make a plan for there. So you, you have to keep all that stuff, um, at the forefront. And that's why, you know, the, from the previous podcast, the systems are so important that, right. you know, how you manage that and visualize that and see that is critical to making sure you don't cause problems with your, with the company or with drivers. Right. Uh, and it's not just about their personal situation, but also, uh, potential exigent circumstances. We talk a lot about the weather here, not just because we're grumpy old men, uh, sitting on our porch drinking, you know, uh, Arnold Palmer's, Yeah, but, uh, but because the weather is important, uh, right. This is probably something that have you, let me ask you this. How good have you gotten at reading satellite weather information? Oh, really good. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I've got a lot of different places. I've found a lot of different areas like websites where I can find good data. And I've, I found what's kind of become the most reliable. And so that's, that's a big part of it. And so like with Holland Assets Academy, for instance, I mean, that's what one of the things where we've got video and I'll be able to show mm. like, this is what I look for. This is the, this is what it looks like. And, and, you know, uh, in the, in the transportation management system and on, on the Excel spreadsheets we used to use, I'll kind of dive into, here's how we track everything. Here's how I track the home time for drivers. So I make sure I don't, I get them home when they need to be home and, and, and don't want to be, you know, missing major events that are important to them. Cause I, you know, when you do that kind of stuff, all you do is you, you upset your drivers and, and they're not going to want to stick with you. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, driver turnover. It, it's most people don't take into account how big of an impact driver turnover has on a business. And, um, you know, we want to keep our drivers happy. We want them to be happy to work with Holland assets. And, um, so that, that kind of thing's important to us. Win-win. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So timing. And I'm not talking about the 24 hour clock at this point, but uh, timing. When do you book the load? Uh, it, like when in the cycle of the driver experience do you book the load? Uh, so are you are you doing it five days beforehand or is it that they've dropped off their load in Florida? Okay, it's time to find them a load now. That's a right. really good question. And there's lots of different philosophies on that. And let, let's talk a little bit about that. So, so typically let's start, uh, I'm trying to find a load for a driver out of Utah mm. with our shippers in Utah, where we've got better relationships, we've got a little bit more flexibility. And I usually don't have to book those loads until about a day before they're ready to leave, which is good. And so, you know, if I've have, have a driver that's been at home in Utah that, uh, said, tells me, Hey, I'm ready to go on Wednesday and today's Tuesday, I'll typically shoot them a text on Tuesday, like early Tuesday and say, Hey, you still good to go tomorrow. They'll confirm yes. Mm -hmm. And then I'll book a load for the next day. Um, and, and then sometimes depending on the driver, like if it's one of those drivers that wants to run just 500 miles a day, I'll, I'll probably typically book the load to leave the day that they want to leave. Where if it's, I've got one of those guys that wants to drive 700 miles a day and, and drive just as much as they can. Sometimes we'll go pick up the load the day before they want to leave and have it ready and for have them. it ready for them so that they're, they can just hook on and go. And, and at that point, does that have to do with managing their hours? It has or? to do with, well, managing their time. Like if they, you know, if sometimes shippers will, they'll um, book a load that, you know, really takes, let's say it's four days worth of transit but they've the way they've booked it it's got five days built into it to do it to do it and so or they'll have you know it, it really only needs four days but they book four and a half days you mm. know a lot of times we'll pick it up a little bit early with a driver that we trust yeah that that is going to just run hard and get it there on time um we'll we'll do that kind of thing let me ask you this how involved is the driver 
uh, on a day-to-day basis. So you, you sat down with them at the beginning of the process when you hired them, you got to know them, and you're continuing to get to know them as a general proposition uh, throughout their employment. But how involved are they as you're booking loads? Are you are you say are you calling your driver up and saying, "Hey, I've got this one. Does this work for you?" Or do you kind of just say, "Here's your schedule." It depends on it. the driver and the situation. So mm-hmm. some drivers, like you know, they'll tell me, "I just I don't need to be home till this day," and then I'll just kind of I you know if, if that day is quite a ways out, I can I know I've kind of got a carte blanche carte blanche to book whatever. Yeah. Um, other situations, like just on the drive in today, I was talking to one of my drivers because she needs to get routed through a certain area. And so we kind of, you know, I walked through what I was seeing and what I was finding and talking about the timing of getting there. Um, and so it, it's kind of really on a case by case basis. So most of the time I can just, I, I know what I, needs to happen. I don't necessarily need to contact the driver first before booking a load, but if there's something cr- a little different on that load, you know, maybe it's got an extra short run time or maybe it's got some extra time or they might be able to do a 34 hour reset in the middle of the run. I'll typically call the driver, talk through with them mm. and just make sure they feel comfortable with it. I, I usually do that if it's, if there's something a little non-typical in the run. Okay. So it, these timings that we're talking about, are they different depending on whether you're booking with a direct shipper or if you're going through a broker or hitting a load board? How do the timings change in that case? It, a lot of the times, if it's something off the load board, it's really hard to change things. Right. Um, a, a lot of the times, if it's a shipper or broker we work with on a regular basis and depending on their customers' needs, there's there's oftentimes some ability to shift things around a little bit. And so it's just, it's communicating. It, um, I always try to be upfront with our brokers. Like if I think there's going to be some kind of, I, I won't say I always try, I always am mm-hmm. upfront with, with our brokers. If there's something a little, like if, if there might be a, a, a really tight timeline between when a driver drops off and when they're going to pick up. I'm going to let them know that before we even commit to the load. Cause I like, if something does go wrong, I want to be able to like communicate, like we knew this was a potential issue. And when you do that, they're usually, if there is an issue, they're usually fine with it. Like we just had this kind of situation happen yesterday. I, I booked a load that was going to be really tight. Like it was basically as long as everything, as long as the driver got unloaded <laughs> in two hours, yeah. which is, is kind of what you hope it to be. It, but maybe that happens 50% of the time. Mm. Um, he, everything would have been fine. But if it was going to take longer than two hours, which is common, um, it, it, we were going to run into issues. So I, I talked through the broker with that. He said, yeah, as long as you, we've got an hour, um, after the appointment time, as long as you arrive within that hour, everything will be fine. And so what ended up happening is it was like right close. It actually went over that extra hour. And so at that point I'm calling the, the, um, shipper, Hey, I've got a truck inbound. He, it, there was a bit of deadhead. There's he's a couple hours out. Here's the situation. Um, what can we do? And I worked with the shipper and everything mm. ended up turning out fine. But you know, if I wouldn't have notified the broker that that was a possibility, then, yeah. Things can get dicey. You know, it's it's funny. Uh, communication is, it, it seems like such a basic point, but it's actually really difficult to master or to get over ourselves and communicate. Because I think there's this part of so many of our brains that says, well, don't make waves. Don't, don't, uh, don't tell somebody there's a problem. Just hope it goes away, right? Yeah. Like it's, uh, oh, this feels confrontational or the, this feels uncomfortable. But think back to <laughs> think back to your junior high or high school classes and who was the kid that the teacher liked the most, the kid that actually talked to the teacher and told them what was going on. I don't yeah. know. That's a, a dumb analogy, maybe. But the idea being, if you just communicate and let people into the loop, then a lot will be forgiven, right? hundred percent. Like even on that load, like the, every, like almost bar none every time I have a situation like that and I'm talking to the shipper, they're like extremely thankful that we're communicating. That you just gave them a call. Yeah. Yeah. That you give them a heads up. And so that goes a long way. And my, my philosophy in life is, is problems never get better with age. Like they only get worse. And so if you're not communicating (laughs) and giving somebody a heads up sooner rather than later, that problem's just going to get worse. And their anger level is just going to be worse once everything kind of comes crashing down. And so um, always communicate. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. All right. So any other issues around uh, booking loads, load boards, yeah, let, brokers? Let, let's talk some more about the timing. Because, okay. you know, we, we talked a little bit about what happens, you know, with loads coming out of Utah. Um, typically what I will do is, is once I book a load going out of Utah, let's just, again, let's, let's say it's a Utah to Texas load. Um, as soon as I know, like I've got that load booked and it's essentially official, I'll, even if we haven't picked the load up yet, um, I will start reaching out to brokers and shippers that I have relationships with in Texas, in Texas mm-hmm. that I know operate out of that area and ask if they have a load. And, and I'll usually try to give them some time to find something. Um, and, and if I don't have something from one of them and, and it kind of depends on how solid those relationships are. Like if I, if I have really solid relationships in that area, I'll, I'll typically go to two days before the delivery, sometimes maybe even a day before the delivery. But if I don't have anything for that truck going out within two days, I'm typically starting to hit the load boards hard. And so when I say two days, two, six a.m. starting <laughs> sure. days, like I don't want to start, you know, you know, if I say today's Monday and that truck's going to be there on Wednesday, I want to make sure I've got Monday morning and Wednesday morning that I'm looking for that load or Monday morning and Tuesday morning. If you, let's say you call up a broker and say, hey, I'm going to be in this area. What do you got for me? They say, I'll get back to you. And then, okay, you're, you're 48 hours before. And so you hit the load board. And I'll usually hit them up one more time okay. right before, right before you go to the load board mm-hmm. or even as I'm going to the load board, just to kind of give them a reminder. Yeah. And, and again, this kind of depends on how familiar you are. Like brokers that I work with on a really regular basis, like I can, like I can text them. I can mm-hmm. and usually get a really quick response or, you know, I'll, um, you know, it, it, it becomes, you know, I, I can I typically have a comfort level of, I know whether the likelihood of them getting me something's really low or if it's still kind of high. Okay. Like the guys that I work with on a regular basis, I may feel comfortable waiting for 24 hours if they're like, yeah, I think I'm going to have something, but I, I'm not going to know until tomorrow at 11. I'll usually give. You'll give them that time. Yeah. And uh, I was, and most of the times they come through, sometimes they don't, then I'm, I, I've got to, I, I scramble a little bit. Okay. But that doesn't happen too often. Do you ever cancel a load in favor of another one that didn't come through quick enough or once you like say you get on the load board uh for a somewhat lower uh rate and then the broker comes back two hours later and says hey i've got something great for you can you do you ever cancel i I have never done that no i am kind of the the type of person like i feel like once i've committed some to something Mm. i'm gonna follow through with that and so i have i'm not saying there would not be a circumstance where i would do that i i don't see that i see that being very few and far between i haven't done it yet it'd have to be something pretty drastic for me to cancel on somebody else okay like i don't like i i don't feel like that's a good business practice no neither do i I just uh... but i don't I don't think oh, it's does a good it? idea. Is that a, a pretty common I would thing? Say maybe maybe not a lot, but it does happen. Okay. Yeah. It's uh I uh <laughs> commitment is uh, has been a watchword of mine for like the last decade. Yeah. Uh, Cuz it can be very frustrating in any circumstance or or any uh, uh area of life, yeah. right? To have uh, somebody be non-committal. So, okay, good. Um Sorry, you were going to say. Yeah. So I, another thing that kind of along the same similar topic that I want to talk a little bit about is um, one of the um, battles or, you know, differing philosophies that you see in dispatching is, do I wait for the last minute to book a load or do I book a load well in advance? Um, it, the the argument for people that like to wait to the last minute is that that's when you find the desperate brokers that are going to be willing to increase their price, Uh, gaming the system, gaming the system, increase the price. And like they get desperate. So they're, they're willing to narrow their margins a little bit and give Mm. the price to the carrier. Does that happen? Absolutely. It does. Um, Is every broker going to be like that? Um, No. And so I, in, in my opinion, I don't like that method. Don't like it. It it, it feels like a drivers. It, it, 
increases my anxiety. <laughs> Will you on occasion get a higher paying load? Yes. But on occasion also, you're not going to be able to find a load. And you're going to leave somebody s- sitting. Right. And so, or you're going to get desperate too. And end up taking end a up lower taking fee. A lower fee. And so like, I do not like that. I have found that like, like a lot of times you'll find stuff three or four days in advance. And I think the brokers that are looking for good carriers are posting, you know, market rates in that area and, or even slightly above market rates in that area. And you can, you know, if you've got a little bit of time, you can find those. Mm. And so then you don't have to, you don't have to wait till the last minute. So I I guess my, my point is, I think you can typically get just as good paying loads on that stuff that you're booking further in advance than necessarily waiting till the last minute and finding somebody who's desperate that's willing to pay you. And, and this goes to something that we have talked about uh, innumerable times on this podcast, which is cultivating relationships, building, you know, whether it's direct shippers or brokers or whatever, cultivating your relationships. This is very golden ruley. You know, how would you like it if yeah. somebody kind of was trying to take advantage of you when you're at your most desperate? You wouldn't care for that very much. Don't don't do it to somebody else. Absolutely. Yeah. And and drivers don't like drivers just don't like that. Like I, I was talking mm, to one yeah. of my drivers that I've been dispatching for several months now. And, and one of the things that he said that he really has appreciated and liked that, that I have done, like right now I've got him on, you know, three loads. Like he knows his next the mm. load that he's on and two more loads after that. And, uh, so that they can plan a little bit. They, they, you know, the last thing that they, they hate it when they deliver a load and they don't know where they're headed next. They don't even know which direction to go to park their truck to wait for the next load because it, you know, the next load could be north, south, east, or west of them. So <laughs> right. I I don't like doing that. And I've since I've been dispatching, um, I think there's only been one time where I've made a driver sit like more than well, without knowing what the next load's gonna mm, be. Right. And that was pretty early on when I was still kind of trying to figure things out. And it's which kind of reminds me this isn't just about oh the personal philosophy or the morality behind (laughs) what we're talking about but also the economics of it if you're waiting till the last minute you know i'm kind of putting myself not just in your shoes dealing with eight trucks right now but also if i'm just an owner operator and i'm kind of trying to ride the the tip of that wave and uh playing it risky like that you could sit you could lose out not just taking a lower paying load, you could get no load at all, right? And mm-hmm. have a driver sit for too long. So yeah, which is just it, it, usually that's not good for anybody. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anything else on that subject that not, you want to specifically on that one? Mm-hmm. I think maybe now just transition. I, one last thing I want to talk about before we're done is uh, just taking notes. Like I, I'm a information is power, right? And, and I don't remember things very well. So I talked a little bit in the last podcast about Evernote that I use as a note taking system. Mm-hmm. Um, I take notes on my interactions. Like, so I try to keep notes on brokers that I've worked well with in specific States in those areas. Mm-hmm. Um, it, when I have, you know, this is something I want to try next time I come into this area, I, I record that. Or if I think I've found a, a process that works well, I'll make sure I write that down. So just, Take notes about everything and then go and review those notes on a, on a somewhat regular basis. So what uh, sort of things are you taking notes on that, that might be unexpected? Oh. Like for instance, um, you know, around Christmas time, um, I, I took some notes on um, areas of the country that seemed to get, you know, like fruit baskets, <laughs> people that were building fruit baskets where I can take yeah. a truck because the, the market seems to be a little hotter in that area than normal. Um, you know, stuff like was that. that a, was that a real load this Christmas yeah. time? Mm-hmm. Fruit baskets. Yeah. That's awesome. Tell yeah. me you got one. <laughs> um, nope, I didn't. <laughs> nah, just kidding. Uh, okay, Chris, uh, anything else about finding loads today? I know we're going to do more on this in the future, but anything else that you wanted I, to go over? I think over? that kind of covers everything I want to talk about. Okay, excellent. Um, uh, you know what? I was, I, I told myself when we started this episode, I'm going to try to think of an impact tip. And I failed, Chris. I failed. I have no impact. I have one. <gasps> you do? Yeah. Okay. Go out and um, join the email list on oh. um, Holland Assets <laughs> Academy. Oh, boy. Look at that. Ever the pro. A shameless plug. 
<laughs> ever the pro. Yeah, go to um, episode 146, hollandassetsllc.com. Look up that episode and you should get a pop-up on uh, to, to join the email list and we'll keep you posted on how it's coming. You, but it should officially launch sometime in the next uh, next few months. We it, it actually would have launched earlier except for... Um, I, I think the, the the module that we're going to do on dispatching and accounting are, are like going to be some of our really good strong modules, mm -hmm. and so um, we've we've held off till we're ready to launch those two, well, at and, least one of them. Yeah, and uh, once we've got that all ready to go, we'll launch the whole system, and and it'll continue to grow as time and evolve as time goes on. But I, I think people are going to be happy about it. Yeah, it's uh, an underappreciated. Uh, aspect of something like this that building it is tough and it, it takes is. time it does uh, it's uh yeah it's quite an investment so show your love hollandassetsllc.com right at the top of the page well not at the very top but there's a button that says episodes click on episodes you'll find this one i mean or you can just click in the show notes for wherever you're listening to this uh and it'll all be there so uh find this episode and sign up we would love to see you there for holland assets academy chris thanks for coming in and i will see you for some numbers in a couple weeks yep are we gonna tell the story too uh are you gonna oh let me tell gosh. My story? i'm not i'm not as good of a story you know what i'll tell you what i'll tell you what let's uh we're gonna roll the credits thanks for listening everybody uh we'll see you next time or in about 15 seconds if you want to hear a story <laughs>
the total cost for the tickets when she first booked them was like 600 bucks, no refund. No. And then the six tickets for the flight to um, back to Barcelona at the last minute ended up being like 1600 bucks. Oh my gosh. That's <laughs> uh, just, I, it was, it was, it was uh, a good lesson in why the 24 hour time clock is a superior time <laughs> clock. <laughs> Next thing you know, you're going to want to adopt the metric system. Uh, yep. Uh, terrible. I already do. 